This week on Quality Digest Live, we find out how to reinvent the workplace. Plus, are you, are you using ISO 9001 incorrectly? We'll find out when we come back. Welcome back to Quality Digest Live for December 20th, 2013. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Dr. Sharm, Editor-in-Chief of Quality Digest. And I'm Quality Digest publisher Mike Richman. Okay, first up on the news this week, a recent study from MIT indicates that the greatest risks in a company's supply chain come not from the biggest suppliers, but often from the smallest ones. This rather surprising finding helps explain why the highest risk in complex supply chains is often so difficult to see. The article, Hidden Risk in Supply Chains, which was originally published in the MIT News blog and ran in yesterday's issue of Quality Digest Daily, uses the intricate supply chain of the Ford Motor Company as an example. David Simke Levy of MIT's Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering led the research team, which discovered that in Ford's case, Profits would be most negatively affected by supply chain disruption involving relatively low-cost components. Conventional thinking amongst manufacturers is often just the opposite. So why? Natural question, why? Why sure. is this? Well, because for major expensive components in complex systems such as automobile manufacturing, there are lots of potential alternative re resources. These are things like car seats and instrument panels. In other words, there's a lot of other suppliers that can supply that kind of stuff, those big ticket items that go into making a car. Sure. Um, so if what happens is if, if there's a natural disaster or a work stoppage or anything else, there's, there's readily all available alternative vendors. So expensive product, low risk. However, greater risk, much greater risk, often comes from smaller firms that supply much less expensive components. These companies make up, in the case of Ford, about 2% of their suppliers, and they provide things like polymers for fuel tanks, brake components, and seat fabrics. In fact, in 2012, a disruption in a European plant that produced these types of polymers had a severe financial effect on auto manufacturers. So again, begs the question, why? Well, in this case, it was because there weren't readily available alternatives. Cheap product, high risk. So the solution, the natural one, I think, is build a second plant in Asia to mitigate the risk. In retrospect, that, of course, makes all the sense in the world. So what we're talking about here, Dirk, is, is this normal take on the situation that that your risk comes from your really expensive stuff the, the people you're spending a lot of money with to, to supply products that you need to, to, to put your stuff together um, you, the assumption is that that's where all the risk comes from there's risk in that sure but because those high ticket items uh, are usually competitive marketplaces there's a lot of other people in them you can pretty much quickly if there's a natural disaster or a work stoppage or anything else you can usually replace that but the small items that are not any less important in putting the whole thing together there's not as much as much uh, I think flexibility in terms of replacing that well I'm wondering if, if also your your high risk high cost items also it's possible that those manufacturers have better processes in place and have their own uh, their own risk management uh, things in place whereas a small com uh, a small lower cost component manufacturer may not be prepared to deal with catastrophes as a larger one might you know not not mentioned but probably yeah I think yeah. that's probably probably the case as well and, and, and again it's it's this fact that the, sl the small things that aren't very expensive still are really important in putting your, your automobile or whatever it is that you're putting together together so you need all the stuff and, sure. and if any of it goes out you're gonna have a problem but the the bigger ones are the ones that you can more easily replace so that's that's the, the moral of the story. And, and by the way, a paper on this research is going to appear next month in the Harvard Business Review. So, so look out for that. And uh, of course, for more information on this news item and all the pieces that Dirk and I are going to be covering on today's show, be sure to click on the story links just below the video player right down there. And by the way, just a reminder, uh, if you have any comments during the course of the show, mm -hmm. uh, feel free to send them to us. Uh, just e send us an email to uh, qdl at qualitydigest.com and uh, we might just get it on the show. Yeah, the I, and, and actually that's a good point because we're going to be uh, having an interview with, with Marcy Schulte and Megan Gordon of Gensler here in a few moments about the, right. the workplace and they're going to be open to your questions as well. So if you, you, uh, you have some questions for Marcy and Megan, get them on the air, get, get them over to us and we'll get them on the air for you. Okay, well here's maybe a little bit of a public service announcement, at least I look at it that way. <laughs> uh, at Quality Digest we really like to highlight the efforts of members of our industry uh, to help in the 
promotion of science, technology, engineering, math, or the, the STEM, uh, the STEM uh, topics. Uh, particularly for tomorrow's uh, technology workers. So our friends at Olympus have partnered with the Smithsonian, the world's largest museum and research complex, to create Curious. Uh, Curious is a, a new hub of scientific activity and education based at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's a, uh, Curious it's, itself is a comprehensive 10,000 square foot experiential learning center with the, uh, the Natural History Museum there at the Smithsonian. So according to the S S Smithsonian, <laughs> Curious is a, uh, it's a first of its kind interactive and experimental environment and uh, through this and through involvement with, with scientists and in interactions with thousands of authentic objects, vi visitors can experience how science is relevant to them and how they can develop the skills to become the scientists of tomorrow. So obviously this is kind of geared toward uh, younger attendees and, and so forth. So uh, Curious is designed so that students and other visitors will contribute to the world's body of scientific knowledge and participate in investigating actual research questions by working with actual research objects. And a key part of the process is that students, with the help from uh, Smithsonian scientists, will use professional level microscopes and other instruments to probe and study specimens that get them excited about the, the scientific process. So Olympus is supporting the center with a donation of dozens of microscopes and imaging systems and so forth that will enable uh, museum visitors along with uh, also remote participants via the internet to access more than 6,000 bones, minerals and fossils in the museum's collection and engage in, uh, you know, in an active ongoing scientific inquiry. So they donated 50, Olympus donated 50, mm -hmm fully loaded professional scientific microscopes uh, and imaging systems. They're also providing a DSX-100 optodigital imaging system which will capture detailed 3D images of, of specimens for archiving and, and online access. And what's cool about this is that people will be able to join in aspects of the curious experience from anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. So that's just part of the list, but along with hardware and software, Olympus is also providing uh, extensive staff and time for training and support. So we like to put these stories out there really as an encouragement to other companies. It's kind of like, okay, Olympus stepped up, mm -hmm. your turn. Yeah. And we want companies, and, and not just companies that manufacture equipment, but, but even just maybe you're a manufacturing company and you want to contribute to, uh, to STEM knowledge in whatever way you can. It can be equipment uh, to a local science and technology museum. Almost every big city's got one. It can be volunteering uh, knowledge experts from your company to give maybe fun techie demos on a subject. You know, whatever it is. I mean, the, the idea here is get involved. We keep talking about uh, how important STEM education is. Not all of it is going to come from, uh, you know, our, our grade schools and our middle schools and our high schools and our, our universities. A lot of it really needs to get uh, industry involvement, either through maybe the donation of equipment, but a lot of times just showing kids what's going on or yeah. showing young adults what's going on. I mean, nothing is cooler than having somebody come in and do a hands-on kind of techie yeah. show and tell about, you know, robotics or lasers or lasers or <laughs> lasers because lasers are cool or 3D printing or whatever. I mean, you know, people, it makes more sense when you can see an actual live demo of something. A lot of companies are, are capable of doing that. Sure. And it fires up the, that younger generation, which it we fires need, it up. Yep. Need, need anyway. So good, good stuff there. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Dirk. And thanks, Olympus and Smithsonian for a great program there. All right. Well, we're going to turn now to our future articles. And as many of you know, and if you don't, you should know, one of the best ways to ensure that employees are engaged and excited by their jobs is to have them work in a great working environment and uh, you know for many of us who who do office work for a living the challenge and that's all of us here the challenge really is to find ways to to incorporate movement and variety into one's daily routine I think that's a big problem with a lot of office workers is the, is the work might be really engaging and interesting but you're kind of nailed down to your desk many times and you're not really uh, getting a lot of exercise you're not really doing much other sure. than just doing that 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 knowledge work so Gensler, the world's largest architecture and design firm, has taken on the challenge to consider not only the well-being of the company, but that of employees and the broader society in the design of workplaces, which is really, really great stuff. So, to tell us more about how Gensler is acting on this mission and what it might mean for the future of your workplace and ours, we're joined now by Gensler Minneapolis's design director, Marcy Schulte, and senior interior designer, Megan Gordon. Marcy and Megan, welcome to the show. 
Hi. Hi. Thanks, thanks for having us. Thank you for joining us again, and, and it's a pleasure. We, we want to kind of jump right into it now. Your article, Reinventing the Workplace, which ran this week in Quality Digest Daily, talks about five elements for life that matters. So can you explain to us what those five elements are and, and where that concept originated? Sure, we've been doing a lot of research on this very topic. Um, it affects a lot of our clients. Um, but we did reference this one book in particular, um, Well-Being, The Five Essential Elements by Tom Rath and Jim Harder. And the five um, essential elements according to this book is the career well-being, social well-being, physical well-being, financial well-being, and community well-being. And it's how all of these five elements interact together. And workplaces really can, can kind of foster that, I think, is what is Yeah, what the point I think there's some that, um, you know, lend themselves easier to the workplace, but they're all um, important aspects. Gotcha. Well, and now, of course, our, our audience is composed of quality professionals, test and measurement, quality assurance folks, and quality means many things to many people, I think, but the quality of one's physical workspace really is, is often, many times, overlooked. So from your respective experiences, how do you think that design changes, such as the ones you're talking about here, can help companies improve? Great question. This is a question that's top of mind for many of our clients. And in discussion with our clients and our team here, we've challenged ourselves to consider, what if you left work healthier than when you arrived? Um, what if rather than feeling depleted at the end of the workday, you felt satisfied, you felt energized, you had a greater sense of well-being? And so that's charged our work and design thinking in this area. There are three key factors that have been shaping our research and our work. Uh, first is just the recognition that things are changing and the boundaries between work and life are changing. Um, now we're taking calls off hours, we're working more on weekends, and so that definition of work and non-work time has changed. We used to think that we got healthy after work, work was work, and after work, um, we had life and we would exercise and get healthy. We can't think that any way anymore as work has become more sedentary. So, secondly, a couple more quick points. Human capital is critical for companies. It's often their largest business expense. And as companies need to compete um, more and more for team members, talented team members and baby boomers age out of the workforce, this becomes a bigger issue. What's the quality of my work environment and how does it contribute to my overall well-being? Last piece is it's not just the chair anymore. It's the car, it's the light, it's the window, it's the campus, the corporate campus. How do all of those things work together to make a great environment, not only for the company, but for the community within which the company works? Can, can, can you give me an example of uh, from a design perspective, what you're actually doing that facil facilitates what you just mentioned? I think one of the pieces we've talked about, it's a combination of many things. Some, some of it is furniture, some of it is about incorporating walking paths throughout a building, and that's not only just in the workplace uh, plan and the positioning of where amenities are versus where uh, workspaces are. It might also be how do you walk through the entire building? How are stairs designed to make a great design element, a great experience, and a place that encourages you to, you to move rather than get on an elevator, for instance? You know, there's a lot of evidence, and, and, and a lot of it's quoted in your article, thank you for that, about how promoting well-being in the office can yield happier and, and more productive employees. But how do you convince management, and how do you convince management <laughs> with data? Are there, are there measurables to this kind of improvement? I think so. Um, there, are, there are a lot of research articles um, on this very topic, and there are more and more as um, this topic becomes more and more popular. Um, but in our discussions with our clients, it's a, really about a two-factor um, element. It's about the physical space. So one, you have to build the space to um, uh, promote well-being. But equally as important is that policy behind that uh, wellness in the workplace needs to follow. So employees need to feel comfortable that it's okay to leave your desk for an hour um, to take a um, do some work on a walk station or take a walking meeting with a um, colleague to figure out some work solution. Um, but we really see it hand in hand and you can't really do one 
without the other, without losing that um, return on investment. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we have readers all over the world, and I, I think there's, there's a feeling, there's a sense that I have, at least might be wrong, that maybe uh, in Europe there's, there's more of a, of a sense of this, there's more of a feeling of the importance of this. So how, how do you feel that the, the shift in thinking in terms of workspaces uh, in the United States compares to the thinking on this topic in other parts of the world? And, and I would add, it's my feeling that particularly in Scandinavian yeah. com countries, this seems to be, at least that's what we hear about, you know, Norway and, mm -hmm. and Sweden, where this, this, seems, this thought seems to be a little bit more prevalent. And there's a longer history, especially as you mentioned in European companies around, for instance, access to daylight was really considered as, as a right of a worker. So access to a window or to daylight or to view is just baked in, let's say, into our attitudes about workspace uh, there. Um, in the United States, the tradition has been that we're focused more primarily on reducing insurance costs and healthcare costs. That's changing as work has become more sedentary, and you know, I think it's close to 80% of jobs are becoming sedentary now. That um, epidemic of obesity is driving us to uh, get mobile, to get exercise, to get that integrated into our day for overall health. You know, it leads right into my, my final question for you, which is let's, let's talk a little bit more about movement, because I, I know that you know, there's been a lot of research. We've all read it about how sitting for long periods of time, six hours or more, can be so devastating to one's health. So many of us here at Quality Diet just use a stand-up desk. I do myself for most of the day, and, and I know that I, I definitely feel a lot better, fresher, more creative when I stand and move and do all that. Um, but how do, you, I mean, how do you keep people productive if they're constantly moving? I mean, especially if maybe they're moving away from their work center. I mean, are there things like... like like mobile work centers that can be, be developed in, in this case? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think when we talk about wellness in the workplace, we automatically think it has to be physical, which is a really, really important factor. Um, but there are also, are also um, other factors that um, can, pr can promote productivity in the workplace as well. For example, we just did a large project where the well-being and wellness in the workplace was a really, really major factor. And we provided um, things like quiet rooms where people can go away from their desk for an hour or however long they need to get away from the distractions of the phone from coworkers to just get some heads down work done um, to make them feel more productive in the day. Um, so that also contributes to our well-being. But things like walk stations and the way uh, a plan is um, designed so there's um, a larger walking path throughout departments um, really promotes well-being. Um, not every task is uh, appropriate for a walking meeting or even walk station tasks, um, but it's all about choice for that individual. Um, and it's a conscious choice, too, of what can I do um, to be more active in my day versus just automatically thinking I'm going to go to a conference room to have this meeting or I'm going to sit at my desk and do this typing. Okay, well, Megan and Marcy, I appreciate uh, both of you being on the show with her from, mm -hmm. from Ginsler. Um, I mean, it is important uh, quality of, you sure. know, the quality of our workplace sure. is just as important as the quality of our product. They are actually... Uh, inextricably entwined. Yes. So uh, thanks to both of you for being on our show today. And if you, if you have more uh, questions about uh, maybe what Ginsler is doing, if you go to the article below the player page, there is a link in the bio that will go out to Ginsler, I believe. Gensler, is that right? okay. Gensler's homepage, yes, sir. Okay, well, thanks for joining us. Thank, Thank you, you for having us. Thanks for having us. Have Thank a great us. weekend. You too. Bye. Bye. Right. Good stuff there. Yeah, we, you're right, Dark. I think that we do. We we don't oftentimes think about it, but we should. We should really think about how the quality of where we work and how we feel about how we where we work contributes to productivity. Yeah, and, yeah, ab and, absolutely. And excellence, no doubt about it. Yep. Okay. Um, Interesting article this week, uh, in, in Dan Nelson's article, Wouldn't You Want to Know, Nelson takes a look at how ISO 9001 is being misused, and he, he asked the question, wouldn't you want to know if you were misusing a tool, any tool, whether it's a, a hand tool or a management tool? We all know that if you don't use a tool the way it was intended to be used, you're not going to work as efficiently, or, or perhaps even worse, you will actually hamper what it is that you're trying to accomplish. Well. ISO 9001 is the same way. Nelson believes that too many companies are still trying to structure their documentation uh, to fit what they think the standard is asking for. Or they will buy some off-the-shelf documentation template that meets the requirements, but really actually not the spirit mm -hmm. of ISO 9001. And the important thing to understand here, and, and Nelson talks about this, is the standard was never, ever 
from its conception meant to be implemented that way. As Nelson points out, uh, even in ISO 9001, uh, 2000 and 2008, subclause uh, uh, 0.1 in the introduction quotes, it is not the intent of this international standard to imply uniformity in the structure of quality management systems or uniformity of documentation. Boy, that's, it's right there in black and white. That's it's, pretty clear. Yeah. It's right there. And actually, what's interesting, I had to go back. We, we started mm -hmm. covering, Quality Digest started covering ISO 9001 right when it first right came out. I think the first edition was... 87, I think. Uh, or 84, I think, yeah. or somewhere in there. It anyway. was in the 80s, yeah. Even back then, ISO 9001 was called a framework. It is a framework. It has always been a framework. And when we first started reporting back at uh, 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 back in 84, even then, as I said, it was, that is how it was described. And the way to think of a framework, and I was trying to think of maybe an, an analogy for this, but think of a home. Mm -hmm. I mean, you're going to build a home, and you know you have to abide by certain rules. There's, there's rules on how you put in plumbing, there's rules on how you put in uh, uh, electrical. So there, there's guidelines and there's, you know, regulations and so forth that you, you have to abide by in order to get your house signed off on by the inspector. Think of the inspector as an auditor. auditor sure. But the house itself, it's what you want it to be. It's your house. It's however many square feet you want it to be. It's however many stories you want it to be. The layout is the color, the materials. That's all up to you. It's your house. The rules are intended to help you build your house the way you want it to be, but staying within the guidelines that you have. And an organization is no different. The idea behind ISO 9001 is, look, if you're going to be audited at ISO 9001 and be registered, here are the guidelines we want you to meet. But the guidelines are there to serve you, not vice versa. You're not writing your documentation and structuring your processes and doing everything else that you do within your organization to meet the, the, some sort of proscriptive idea of what you think the standard is. It's the other way around. You have a process, you're going to document the process, and you're going to put whatever uh, things in place that ISO 9001 says you, you need to have in place, corrective and preventive action, and so on and so forth, which really help you strengthen your quality management system. Yeah. So it's the other way around. And this is really actually important. And Nelson writes that, that QMS documentation is supposed to describe a system of processes designed to output quality project, uh, products or services. And, and the process in question are those that are needed consistently, uh, uh, a consistent output um, to provide a quality product. And there's kind of two different types of processes. You've got your, your core processes and you've got your support processes. Together, Nelson writes, this system of core and support processes is the QMS, is the QMS. Mm -hmm. QMSs are properly structured according to uh, organizational structure paying particular attention to core processes. The most important processes of any organization, QMSs should not be defined according to the uniform requirements of ISO 9001 because no two organizations are precisely alike. Each QMS is different. Critical. Yep. So, no one likes to be told that they're doing something wrong. Nobody wants to come in and say, oh, you're doing your QMS completely wrong. But this really should be a relief. What we just told you, what Dan Nelson said, really should be a relief for companies that have been struggling with their ISO 9001 implementation and thinking that, you know, that the value of ISO 9001 has no value. Well, yeah, it has no value if, for the way you're doing yeah. it, if you're doing it all backwards, yeah. right? I mean, but if, yeah. if, if, if you implement ISO 9001 properly using a process approach, which, by the way, is since 2001, I believe, has been a process approach. Mm -hmm. And you're using ISO 9001 as a framework rather than pros some proscriptive set of rules that dictates how to run your business, which, as we said, was never intended to do, then two things will happen. First, it's going to be easier to implement. You're not trying to turn your whole mm -hmm. organization upside down to meet the standard. You're simply implementing the standard toward what you already have within your organization. More important, it's going to have more value. The whole idea behind ISO 9001, as Nelson points out, is to provide value for your organizations, to give you a framework to build your quality yeah. system upon. And value for your customers, too. And, and, well, yeah, yeah, sure, yeah, that's, that's the end result. Naturally false. I think the, the companies, the organizations that 
uh, that have a struggle with this are the ones that register to ISO 9001 for the wrong reason. They, exactly. they do it for the reason that they feel like it, they need to from a marketing perspective or a competitive advantage or whatever it Which may they be. May. When they may, but, yeah. but when you go into it saying, okay, we gotta do this, and then, we, and then you, you're going into it with the attitude that it's something you have to do, it's gonna be prescriptive, and just tell me what I gotta do, and, and you print out the standard and then just go down the line and follow it. If you do it that way, you're never gonna really improve because again, you're doing it for the wrong reasons. If you do it for the right reasons, which is the reason to improve and to service your customers better, naturally out of that you're going to begin to understand that this is a framework and that this is a living, breathing document that helps you, according to your own uh, your own uh, processes, improve what you're doing. So if you go in for the right reasons, it'll be a lot easier for you to grasp this concept. If you don't and you're struggling with this, maybe that's an indication that you need to look at why your ISO 9001 or any ISO standard ready. Yeah, if you feel you're not getting value yeah, yeah. out of it, most likely it's because you're doing something wrong. You're you're doing something wrong and you're not doing it for the right reasons. Yeah. So really, really good story. And you know, as, and as it's as, kind of common sense. To, I mean, we've been I, saying this for a long. Sure. People have been saying this for a long time. Yeah. But it's it's always good to I think kind of reiterate. It. I think I think so too. And you know, hey, you know, another huge huge version of ISO 9001 is coming out. You know, this coming year we're going to be talking about it a lot yeah. as it, as it continues to work its way through. So keep that one firmly in mind. And I think we're going to be hearing a lot more uh, from from Dan Nelson as well. You know, and by the way, uh, Dan Nelson and others have said that this, this idea of process orientation and so forth is emphasized, uh, we believe, even stronger in 2015. Yeah. Uh, the ISO 9001 2015 coming up from what we've heard. So. Yeah, so check, check that out. Okay, thank you, Derek. Well, it's time now for our final 2013 Tweet of the Week, and it comes to us from the Twitter user with the handle of RAF, who quotes Friedrich Nietzsche, we should consider every day lost on which we have not danced at least once. Good advice. Good advice Let's there dance. from RAF and from Friedrich Nietzsche. Yes, I'm dancing, I think. I'm dancing. <laughs> I think dancing we should all, all remember that for 2014 is to dan a dance a little bit song? more. Dancing, uh, on the dancing on the ceiling. Oh, dancing on the ceiling. <laughs> Something like that. I, I'm, that's ashamed, a little harder. I'm ashamed I even know that. <laughs> yeah, that's anyway, pretty scary. <laughs> <laughs> so that's your tweet of the week, the last one for 2013. All right. Uh, so, uh, what have we got coming? We got a, oh, we, we got a ponderings coming up. But be, before, before that, that, we have to acknowledge. That's right. Something. Um, uh, our director, uh, our, our director for this show, I should say, uh, Daniel Luna, is going to be leaving us to pursue a career in music full time. Mm -hmm. So we are really excited for him about that, but kind of sad uh, that we're going to be uh, <laughs> put up that slide. Yeah, there is. That is. Daniel playing there? There he there is. There he is. That's All our right. very own Daniel Luna. Pursuing his, his musical career. He's a fantastic uh, guitarist, uh, really. Blues. He's a, he's, a, he's, a great, he's a great director, too. Um, and so we're going to be really losing some talent, but uh, uh, we'll be bringing in some, some more talent because that's what we do here. That's right. So uh, with, a, with our, our, uh, our, our video partner, uh, Rocket Spot. That's so right. congratulations, Duna and uh, Luna. <laughs> Daniel, Daniel, Duna. <laughs> Luna and the Lunatics. That's you guys right. have fun. <laughs> yeah, congratulations, Daniel. Thanks for all that great work uh, for these last couple of years. And we'll miss you, man. All right, well, we're going to close the show now, uh, our last show of the year, with, uh, with ponderings from Mike Micklewright, where he's going to be talking about uh, 5S and hoarding. Good, good topic what? there. Hoarding. Mike, hoarding. Mike Micklewright, that's right. So uh, before we go, before we play you out with Mike Micklewright, we want to wish you all not only a great, a, great, uh, a great weekend, but a really great end of the year, great start to 2014, good holiday season. And we'll be back. We'll be back on the 3rd. Third. The 3rd. Third. We don't have a show next week. Our offices are going to be closed, but, but all of you, again, out there have a great holiday season, a wonderful start to your 2014. We'll see you next year, and, and check this out from, from Mike Micklewright. So long. Bye. Did you ever wonder why hoarding is so popular? Recently I spent some time at a major client and during a luncheon with about eight people we discussed hoarding. Everyone at the table, without exception, knew of a hoarder either in their family or some of their acquaintance. We see it all over TV. People hoard all kinds of stuff, whether it's animals or food, clothes, newspapers, magazines or even garbage. I wonder what else you can hoard. Some people hoard documents. They're called quality leaders or quality managers. Some people hoard mem memories. My wife remembers everything. I wish she wouldn't hoard memories of all my bad past mistakes. And then in business, well, some people hoard other people. <laughs> they like big departments with lots of people, oftentimes to the detriment of a fluid process. In our personal lives, 
Sometimes you gotta move. You gotta get a bigger house. Why? Too much stuff. You gotta move all your stuff. And maybe put some of your stuff in storage. Imagine that. There's a whole industry keeping an eye on your stuff. I borrowed that from George Carlin's famous stuff routine. The industry that George referred to is a $22 billion industry, twice what Americans spent last year on movie tickets. Public storage allows us to hoard our stuff that doesn't fit into our overly stuffed homes. Now, George never once throughout the routine used the word hoarder. He also never used the word hoarder in his other famous routine, the seven words you can never say on television, although it should be considered a swear word. Hoarding is not only a bad word, it sounds like a bad word. So what do you think George Carlin would have said about 5S? You know, the anti-serum to hoarding. He may have said something like this, and now there's a whole new group of people out there making money showing us how to get rid of our bad stuff and how to organize our good stuff. They're called 5Sers. They come into your place of work and take away your stuff. You pay them to take your stuff. They get your stuff and they get your money. They are the customer and they are the customer. You are the supplier and you are the supplier. Then they probably sell your stuff on eBay Meanwhile, you're on eBay looking to buy someone else's stuff when you see your old stuff, which makes you sentimental. And so you place a bid to buy your stuff back after having just paid a 5S'er to take your stuff away. 5S may solve the ills of the common order as long as the bad stuff is disposed of and not put elsewhere. Now I wish I could just do a 5S project on my wife's memory bank. I'm the wise guy, Mike McElright. Thank <laughs> you.